Hello and welcome. In today's lecture, we will focus on the idea of medicine in a pluralistic society, the chapter 10 of Intervention and Reflection textbook. In this section, we tackle the issue of equality in the sense of how equal moral standing pertains to the practice of medicine and biomedical ethics in a society that is a broad amalgam of different features, ideas, and ideologies. We will begin by looking at a different text first as a general primer on all things related to questions of equality. Moral and Functional Value Scales, Understanding the Issue of Equality, is a short article. The link is in the description. When we speak of equality, we have to note that there are two separate ways in which we can use that term. The first one is based on moral equality, which is whether someone is a human being and whether the full scope of human rights apply to them. This is the most commonly assumed meaning when we speak about equality. And it is also critical because, as noted in the previous lecture, denying the humanity of a person, denying their moral equality, places them below you in the moral value hierarchy. The thing is, moral value hierarchies are set up so that whatever is below you becomes something of an object for your use. You can't morally try to exterminate people because they have the same moral value as you do, but find a thing below you, say mosquitoes or cockroaches, and suddenly we're perfectly fine calling in the exterminator. So bringing into question the moral equality of a person, a group of people, and so on, generally causes moral revulsion, because we are all too well aware of the historical uses for such distinction. And so we're not happy about using terms like better or worse, and not even not equal. However, that's not the only way to use the term. The other side of that coin is functional equality. When we speak of functional equality, we are speaking strictly of the ability to carry out some task in a given context. While moral equality locks you into your spot by the nature of what you are, so if you are human, you are better than a mosquito, functional equality ignores any such distinctions. If there is a field that needs to be tilled without modern technology, any 10 humans are worse than one decent ox. That is, the ox is functionally better at a particular task. Any bloodhound is inherently better than any human at jobs that require tracking by scent. And we don't mean to say that the hound ought to have more rights than a human being. And right away you can see the critical implication here. Moral equality holds across all contexts. Functional equality means that I am better than you in some ways, equal to you in others, and worse than you in a third category. And even this relation of better and worse can change as a function of time. Just as importantly, while moral equality does not depend on one's accidental features, for example height, functional equality might, depending on the issue. So if I need someone to crawl through a really tiny AC duct, Steve the Pygmy is functionally better than Yao Ming. And if I need to reach something from the top shelf without a ladder, Yao Ming is better than Steve the Pygmy. Ronaldo and I both play soccer. He is the better player. But if I hit him over the head with a baseball bat, then I am the better player for the time being. And if I need to get downtown Chicago from the suburbs, the Dalai Lama is functionally worse than a bicycle. See how the relation there is relative? And this distinction cannot be overstated. If we get the type of equality wrong, our entire argument is wrong, and the consequences are definitely not what we aimed for. This is crucial for our ability to speak coherently about issues like race, gender, disability, and so on. And it is equally crucial that the audience be aware of which meaning of the term you are using. Reading many of the arguments with that distinction in mind, you will notice that they're focused on moral equality only, or that they conflate moral equality to functional equality. As a result, those arguments do nothing about the functional considerations, which are not tied to a moral position, except in terms of getting the desired job done. Finally, moral equality is an axiomatic assumption. You can't prove moral equality. You assume it as a starting point. And we assume it because you cannot see morality nor measure it. Functional equality is precisely about the things that we can actually measure. It's a performance evaluation whose benchmarks are determined by the particular function that we're trying to fulfill. So, on to the textbook. 
Our authors begin by asking what is equality and how can we speak of equality between people when there are so many obvious differences between them. As a matter of history, they note that in the 19th century, the idea of equal moral standing began coming to the fore in the West, notably in the U.S. That led to the idea that there is nothing natural or inevitable about barriers to one's ability to participate in society, with reference to issues like race, sex, gender, and so on. This movement rejected that social hierarchies were premised on the meaningful natural differences and instead labeled them as mere social constructs. The position also embraced the idea of evolving and expanding notion of equality, where diversity was a good in itself. Thus, the idea of a pluralistic society arose in the West. To be honest, plenty of non-Western societies had already done something like this quite a while back, but they did so while maintaining many of their social hierarchies. And that's because their understanding of moral equality was rather different than our own 19th century starting point, and already encompassed a far wider swath of humanity. With all that pluralism, we are facing the question of making plurality work. And so questions of race, of gender, of ability and disability, among many others, are in need of clarification. The racially based attitudes of the earlier age might have been rejected by science, for example, but there is still the question of using race-based heuristic analyses to better understand and deal with problems. One somewhat controversial approach is the idea of using racial proxies. The idea here is that people of a given region, having resided in that region a long while, are more likely to have shared traits. Now, this would give us some meaningful commonalities of diseases and predispositions for grouping people into functional sets. Notice that this is supposed to be a functional equality claim, not a moral one. However, this approach may fail to account for the complexities of human interactions. And so, it may lead to a misdiagnosis on the basis of some perceived but ultimately irrelevant features, even if that perception is part of the self-identification of the patient. And this is because, as it turns out, a rather large percentage of both black and white people in the U.S. have a lot of DNA from the other side, without knowing it. Second, using the kinds of continental race categories, like white, European, or black, African, or Asian, is entirely too broad to be functional. That approach may let the researchers miss critical similarities across racial and geographical bounds, and it may attribute to a racial predisposition the kind of outcomes that are actually caused socially. As a sort of synthesis between these two ideas, you have the purely statistical model of consideration. This model finds that, for example, we are very much divided in medical issues along racial lines. Problems like rates of particular diseases, of lifespan, likelihood of additional aggravating conditions, and so forth, is clearly divided along things like racial or gender lines. Now, if this model is used as a functional tool instead of a moral one, that is, if we do not attribute additional unjustified meaning to the statistics themselves, then the model is rather useful. And that's because the statistical model does not attempt to assign characteristics, but only tracks them. That way, it doesn't matter whether the apparent increased likelihood of developing some health problem is related to one's race, ethnicity, gender, or just their socioeconomic circumstances. The data is all that matters. So, the idea of race is then taken to be an abstract concept of human variability based on perceived differences. That is, the differences are rather obvious, yet the underlying idea is that the appearance is not highly functionally meaningful. Now, you may be wondering, okay, I'm pretty sure I can tell who's who racially. What do you mean it's an abstract concept or, as the book would put it, a social invention? Well, I actually ran into this question when I moved here to the U.S. and the government forms asked about race. Being from Bosnia, I was pretty sure that I did not belong to most of the list of categories, for example, Asians. But the idea that there was a single category of white was confusing as well. Why? Well, it's because Europeans don't see themselves as part of some big homogenous group of whites. Arabs and Africans ruled Spain for longer than European Catholics and secular governments combined. Most of Europe east of Vienna was ruled by the Ottoman Turks, for 600 years. 
Sicily was ruled by Arabs and Africans for 200 years. Russia, as white as it is, was not considered part of Europe until after Peter the Great in the 18th century. The same Turks that ruled over half of the European continent for centuries and still live in Europe are not accepted as Europeans by other Europeans. When you say Europe, who thinks of Latvia other than Latvians? Sorry, Latvia. Greece is stuck in that not quite Europe Eastern Bloc, but is also part of Europe. The French hate the Germans, and so do the Polish. The Brits hate the French. Ukraine's history with Russia is bad enough. The Balkans have been at war every 50 years for as long as anyone can remember, and all the people there are the same color, same ethnicity, speak the same language, eat the same food, and no one finds that to be a source of solidarity. And while I don't have first-hand experience, I'm pretty sure that people in Africa don't all kumbaya about their Africanness. Instead, they're just as divided along all sorts of political, geographical, cultural, and religious lines. And then, you look at the U.S. definition of white, and you get, quote, White refers to a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East, or North Africa. And I was like, hold on, North Africa? Look, here's some Moroccans. Here are some more Moroccans. Here is a Swedish person. Notice how their whiteness is the same across the national boundaries and how they're all racially similar. Of course they're not. The lines are arbitrarily drawn. And that's why the racial proxy approach has issues. And that's why race is a social construct. There's more diversity within, say, Egypt than between Egypt and Sudan, the neighboring country to the south, which is considered officially black and not white because it's not part of North Africa. You find the same to be the case inside and across just about any kind of overly general groupings. So trying to establish these massive groups is less than functional. That said, the statistical model still works precisely because it's not trying to do these massive groups and it allows for the local and contextual differences to be actually expressed. What is normal, the standard, depends on the local majority. And we can understand that well enough if we just consider the way that, for example, neighborhoods are set up in a major metropolis like Chicago. You find some meaningful degree of homogeneity in the population, in the customs, and in the diet, and so forth. And so you can do a statistical analysis that actually gets you something without resorting to the racial group strategy. Now, in terms of disability, our next issue, we have several definitions that can really be crucial. From a medical perspective, there is the idea of a generally universal standard of human functionality. Disability, then, is something that reduces this functionality, and medically, the job becomes to raise the performance to approach that standard. But ever since the loss of teleology, this idea that human beings as such have a single purpose as a feature of their shared humanity, the social definition rejects a universal standard of human functioning. People who argue in this vein claim that the expectation of, quote, normalcy is actually what creates handicaps, and it's not some natural or inevitable concept. So this side raises three separate definitions. Impairment is a matter of having an atypical or abnormal feature. Disability is the specific limitations that are imparted by impairments. And both of these are obviously medical ideas. But a handicap is the social disadvantage that is conferred upon a disabled person due to social ideas. And this is obviously a social idea. Hopefully, you can see that the line drawn here actually matches our own morality-functionality distinction. The medical ideas are based on the performance standard. These are functional. Literally, they refer to the ability to perform a function. The social ideas are based on moral standing. They're based on moral equality or lack thereof. Next, we have this idea of disability as mere difference. And we saw this in the genetic control readings. The basic premise is that disability is not a problem. It is a defining feature of people who are simply different. Now, we also noted there why this argument seems less than functional when taken to its logical conclusion. Finally, a term that gets thrown around a bunch is, quote, natural. 
and this is done in support of ideas that are natural as well as in opposition to ideas that are not natural. Now, I always personally thought that people who try to use this terminology have not watched enough Nature Channel. Natural and unnatural is either understood as a universal, in which case the same rules have to apply to everything, or as specific to some species, in which case you would have to establish an agreed-upon concept of human nature. If it is intended as a universal, then it fails at its job instantly. Bears eat the young of other bears. Can I cannibalize your child for dinner? It's natural. Can I hunt down your grandma because she's the slowest moving member of your family? Can we engage in reproduction by rape as so many species do? And then can you kill the male after the intercourse as so many insects do? Do you see how that appeal to nature is a dead end? And we have nothing close to an agreement on human nature, so good luck with that. So let's move on to the articles themselves. Susan Wendell argues that the idea of disability is contextual. In fact, we begin our lives as disabled by most standards and become disabled again in our old age, to say nothing of people who acquire a disability through injury, disease, genetic problems, and so on. Thus, being healthy and abled is actually a temporary stage of human development. The stigmatization of disability is, therefore, a social imposition that is needlessly harmful and should be done away with. Beyond that, varieties of disabled cultures are, she says, not in a state of diminished capacity, but have instead created a valuable and rewarding social structure through that. The difference is to be celebrated, not done away with. Now, I'll certainly grant the moral equality argument. However, the idea of health and ability as a temporary stage, I think, is fairly misleading. So, let's use the idea of social context. No one expects a newborn infant to take off running. Why not? Because the, quote, normal at that age of development is specific to that age of development. Similarly, the normal at 15, 45, and 85 are all rather different. We can use this sense of normal as a purely functional one, the same way that the statistics model gave us functional information before. We not only have that idea of normal, we need it. It is on this general sense of normal that we diagnose problems. A 15-year-old with arthritis is not normal, and we expect to see severe issues in order to justify this abnormal problem, and we will keep looking until we find them. An 85-year-old with the same condition is just an 85-year-old. We don't look for extreme issues to justify the condition. The context of normal is the difference that makes a difference. Sure, in comparison to a healthy 15-year-old, an 85-year-old person may be seen as disabled. But in the context of 85-year-old people, there is still the difference between normal, i.e. healthy enough for that age group, and abnormal, right, between abled and disabled. Of course, the prime of one's youth is temporary. But unless you're a fan of comparing apples to asteroids, no one is arguing that the prime of youth is the standard for all people. It's not even the standard for you 20 years later. That means that when we speak of the disabled, we're speaking about a statistical standard of functionality across human performance in that group or age bracket. A person born without arms is certainly not the same as one born with arms, functionally speaking. And that disability, that loss of functionality, is something likely to be a persistent disability. That is not a social construct. Human beings are the kinds of things that, generally speaking, have two arms, two legs, a pair of eyes, a pair of ears, and so on. They have a lot of shared sensory and locomotive functionality. Of course, they have to develop that functionality after birth, and they may lose it down the line. But the statistical and, frankly, genetic model tells us what a human being should be functionally. And that tells us the kind of help that a normal or average person does and does not need. And that lets us build the majority of society. That's why we build houses, not aquariums, because we're the kind of thing that is not a water dweller. 
and if your functionality is compromised badly enough, you die. Again, that is an argument purely from functional equality, and it is unrelated to moral equality. The second article is by Thomas Zaz, and he argues that the diagnosis of mental illness is not a thing. Now, not in the sense that people don't have problems or that those problems don't require help, but rather the idea of mental illness is a notion of deviation from a social norm which is socially determined. The idea, then, is along the lines, who is to say whether that social determination is in any way related to reality? And Saz argues that it's all social, contextual, and without basis in any kind of an objective standard. Beyond that, the idea that mental illness is the cause of social disharmony is kind of key. That is, a normal person, supposedly, inherently follows along harmoniously with the rest of society, so any disharmony must be because the person is not normal. Now, Saz calls this not mental illness, but a, quote, problem in living. Human beings are not the kind of thing that is inherently harmonious. We have conflicts. We disagree. We have a hard time being harmonious with others. Thus, we experience anxiety, difficulties in communication, frustration, and so forth. We are forced to contend with the world, with ourselves, with expectations of ourselves and of others, and to deal with the responsibility for being who we are, who we are becoming, and who we have become. This is not an illness. This is the normal state of affairs. And sure, you work to address these issues and struggle forward, but they're not a thing that happens to you. They're not an abnormality. These are the core features of what it is to be a human being. For comparison, a person who gets meningitis is sick, thus they need treatment. But an average person is not likely to get meningitis, and so they don't have to deal with that problem. But if you apply this to psychology, then we get the idea that a person with a mental illness is sick, and thus they need treatment. The average person does not get mental illnesses, and so they don't have to deal with that problem. But if the varieties of mental discomfort and anguish are part of human condition, then the analogy is bad. To be a human being is to contend with life and with other people, to be anxious and so forth. This is what we all have to do. It is not sickness, it is humanity. And the reason we fall into the trap of calling it mental illness, according to Zaz, is because that labeling is a way to provide us with a social sedative against the problems of living. We get to dismiss the reality of contending with the world, of carrying the burden of responsibility and all that, because we're sick, and the sick are not held to account for their illness. Now, to a certain extent, Zaz seems to be right here. Psychology has moved away from some of these definitions. Uh, his article came out in 1960. But the ideas that psychology is using are still a bit iffy, at least from the outside. For example, mental illness is defined as, quote, health conditions involving a change in emotions, thinking, or behavior, or a combination of these. Mental illnesses are associated with distress and or problems functioning in social, work, or family activities, end quote. Well, shoot, there's no real standard there. A change in emotions does not indicate a change from what to what, just change. The stress is brought on by life, inevitably. Problems in functioning are entirely subjective to the norms one happens to be in. In fact, a number of psychological techniques had to be abandoned after we attempted to introduce them to the Far East, because the social context of those cultures was so radically different from that of the West that they were just useless. The argument here concludes with the acknowledgement that SAS is not negating the presence of actual issues or of the need for help, and so on. He is specifically arguing against the label of mental illness, because it functions as this release from having to deal with life and taking responsibility. This idea is not particularly new. Depending on where you'd like to start from, you can find it in some of the oldest religious texts. An identification with a problem allows a person to say, woe is me, and then gets used to attempt to justify any number of improper behaviors. You find the same idea in Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish 18th century philosopher and a forerunner in psychology, 
who claims that A, we look for ways to offload our responsibility out of dread of having to both contend with the world and be responsible for our performance, and B, we use different kinds of despair brought on by the very act of living to justify ourselves and our irresponsible behavior towards ourselves and towards the rest of the world. It's one thing to get the diagnosis and then move to fix it, to see it as an obstacle that one strives to overcome, like getting over a flu. It's a different thing to use the diagnosis as a crutch to not change those elements of your behavior that need work, to seek to abdicate the responsibility to contend with the world and be held responsible for it. Given the age of the text, it would be interesting to see whether the kinds of problems indicated by Zaz have come to fruition, have gotten better or worse, or are simply non-existent. As a philosopher, the details of that research are not in my wheelhouse, so I will skip speaking about them. However, what is in my wheelhouse is the argument type, and here I just want to turn your attention to the actual pitch. Part of what Zaz is arguing here is that being normal and not normal is a social issue. We just saw this in the disability arguments presented as well as in our genetic control lecture. But then he takes the argument in a different direction. Namely, he tells us that the use of the mental illness as a label has become a way of offloading responsibility for being individually. And it is taken by society to be the sole reason why it's not all just sunshine and roses. And both of those are actually very dishonest positions because they fail to face the reality of the human condition. Life sucks. Life is hard. Life is competition, work, failure, work again, maybe success, and plenty of discomfort, dread, and so on along the way. It's not supposed to be the system where everything is just perfect and everyone is all smiles ear to ear. And the fact that people don't feel this harmoniousness is not the problem, it's the default setting. Thus, trying to sedate those feelings is counterproductive and an abdication of personal and social responsibility to strive and to honestly contend with the world and to take responsibility. A number of existentialist writers would agree with Saz, from Kierkegaard to Nietzsche to Heidegger, and if we don't read the idea as denying that there are in fact serious problems that require one's utmost effort to attempt to resolve, I think the argument holds pretty well together here, at least philosophically. That concludes our lecture on medicine and pluralistic society. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below or shoot me an email. Thank you.